Hello, welcome to chat. My name is Chris Murrow. This is episode 29, uh, Ness and Foraging, which is what I titled it. Uh, oh, for those of you uh, who don't know, um, I'm uploading the episodes on YouTube now. Uh, so you can watch them there. It's under the name Mr. I Love the Ants, which is also my screen name on a lot of places. Uh, so basically this is, um, you know, spring, everything's pretty much woken up. We're looking at an apple tree here, which is buzzing. It's uh, such a shame how much bees, um, don't really show up on film when they're swarming over a tree like this. Uh, well, I mean, it's not that dense of a swarm, but, like, they're all, like, going after these flowers like mad. Uh, not so much honeybees, lots of mason bees and other things, uh, around there. Uh, and I realized that I had some sort of a carpenter bee in, uh, the log that I have here. <laughs> Some type of uh, gold metallic uh, sweat bee, I guess. I don't. I don't. I'm not up with uh, native bees, and well, no, I'm not just not up on bees in, in general, uh, even the imported ones. Yeah. So these ones just kind of dig in there, and then while I was here, I actually noticed that there's this ant that I don't know what it is. I think it's actually an all-black Timnithrax. Uh, but I didn't care enough to film that because now we're looking at Tapanuma sesli, the odorous house ant, which is inside of a uh, yet another. Um, uh, well, they're opportunistic, so they take advantage of places. And you can see this is an old sunflower cane from uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see they just moved right on in there, turned it into a little skyscraper. Lots of uh, brood and things uh, just running around. I believe there was a queen in this video at one point, but uh, like she she just like runs by the camera, and she's not that much larger than the uh, workers, so you really need to keep an eye out for her, but that's not important. Um, Moving on here, we have uh, Tetramorium species, probably species E, but I refuse to do that. Tetramorium is invasive, and basically what they do at this time of year is, um, after getting their regular nest established, they have these foraging lines that they just maintain. And uh, along with uh, being used to just forage, they'll actually start going subterranean and sort of almost move their nest around. And I don't know what that means for the bluets, but, you know, something else to do, or uh, take care of, or, or look into, anyway. And uh, inside the nest we have reproductive brood. Um, generally we have a couple phases for uh, alates, and uh, aphnogaster do this too. And uh, what the phase is, because they don't overwinter their uh, queens, they um, have to produce them for that the same year, or same growing season really. And you can see the uh, larva, yeah, all the large uh, larva here are actually uh, probably go more than likely going to be produced as uh, queens. Uh, moving on to some foraging, we have uh, Formica, which is going you know, pretty much just stealing nectar from a flower. You'll see a lot of that at this time of the year, especially with all the uh, everything in bloom. And uh, going back to a Formica nest, there's some interesting stuff kind of happening out front here. They're also kind of expanding their borders, all the uh, different ants. Sorry for the whole hodgepodge here, but I thought this was you know, too many neat things to put in one video. Uh, we have here a Componatus that's uh, gotten to a skirmish with, I believe, actually another Componatus, but um, anyway, uh, you can see it just has that attached to its antennae for the rest of its life, pretty much. And uh, a little bit later, maybe a day later, um, the Formica colony, I believe Formica and Serta, last time I checked, I, I need to keep up with that. But anyway, what they do is, um, they'll actually tolerate having more than one queen in the uh, same nest for a while. Uh, one queen may be a dominant queen and just be like responsible for laying maybe you know, more than 50% of the eggs, uh, while others, you know, not so much contributing uh, to that. But eventually, during the year, colonies will get too big and they may actually um, uh, expand. And they're doing something come kind of neat. All these uh, little uh, tendrils that you see everywhere are actually uh, flowers to an oak tree above. And you see they're all over the place. And the ants were doing something kind of neat, but first year, um, along with creating a labyrinth for the uh, ants to move their nest here, uh, you can see they were moving brood, I think, earlier. And uh, when they move other workers, they just kind of grab onto one another, and the other ant just kind of balls itself up to make itself easier to carry. Kind of hard to make out, but you can see he's just carrying another ant there across the screen. But they were doing something kind of neat with the... Uh, all the uh, former flowers to the oak tree here. And you see I still haven't raked up last uh, year's leaves. They kind of like, they tug at them, and I don't know what this is. I imagine there's some sort of like, bit of nectar or something just stuck in there. Uh, they were not trying to build a mound. In Serta, uh, Formica in Serta and Formica Palatifulva certainly do not build mounds, so they may move stuff around the entrance just to make it more 
presentable or whatever to, you know, for the colony, but I saw a lot of this. I imagine they're just going after some excess nectar or some sort of food source, but, uh, anyway, they were moving out more into a full sun area, probably taking advantage of a stone that a tetramorium hasn't. Uh, I'm not sure how long that's going to last, though, because there's definitely a tetramorium colony right next to this, uh, uh, tile here. And, uh, I'm trying to get rid of some grass in this area, so I've just threw all these wood chips here, but you can see it's still poking up. Hmm. More foraging, we have Campanas castanius, which is the all-orange species we have here in the northeast U.S. And, uh, going back to sort of, like, foraging on flowers, um, I see, like, these are peonies, which I believe are not native to U.S. or at all, but it's, it's kind of like an, a neat ornamental from the Orient. And, um, what we have here is all the, uh, Basically, all the uh, flower buds have um, like extra floral nectar. I, gu I guess you can use that term, but like, they're just coated with like sap or you know nectar or something like that to attract uh, ant attention. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it definitely has a benefit. You know, a caterpillar is certainly not isn't going to come up and eat a flower to this thing. Not that that's a problem, you know, typically in this country for you know a non-native species to deal with, but sometimes you would you know get the uh, other one imported and. Uh, Basically, you can see here, like, each flower head had a worker devoted to it, and, you know, Campanatus, they're kind of a big ant, actually the largest ants in North America, some species. And, uh, Castanius is definitely among the larger of the, uh, groups, so there are some smaller ones. And they just kind of dance around here, collect nectar, and, you know, it was kind of neat to watch them. Though I gotta say, it was really easy to walk past this. I actually, I, like, I was just, you know, examining a garden, and... <laughs> I just happen to, you know, walk up on their property and start filming. Um, but anyway, here we have a smaller Campanatus also taking advantage of some things here. Uh, aphids are on their way here. You know, if, you, if you're if you a plant and you're not uh, producing extra floral nectar or you're not um, doing something to attract uh, the ants, then, uh, you know, aphids can kind of fill that goal. The problem is the plant doesn't control how many aphids there are. And you'll notice this larva-like thing in the upper right corner here. That is actually a hoverfly larva. And what's neat is, that's a predator of the aphids, so that's a beneficial insect. Uh, but it goes completely undetected by ants. I have never seen an ant actually figure out that this thing is eating their aphid herd. But, you know, it's kind of, it's, it, it's imbalance. And another plant I see lots of ants all over, you know, around the flower parts, is uh, viburnum. Uh, if you're wondering, this is a blue muffin viburnum, though it's it's uh, that's like the cult of our name. I don't know what it is offhand. And we have Chromatogaster carassi here tending to all the uh, flowers. And uh, I'm not sure what the uh, source here, whether it's an aphid or just some sort of nectar or something like they're collecting. I'm going to side with the nectar part because I don't see too much going on inside of that flower area. It's almost like broccoli in a certain angle. Yeah, then we had uh, Tapnuma Cecily on uh, some, uh, what was this plant? It was Golden Alexander, but that's not, we don't get a, that good of a footage of that. So here we have a uh, native honeysuckle, a uh, coral honeysuckle. Species name I don't know offhand, it's, um, it's, it's in the hon honeysuckle. Just Google hor coral honeysuckle or native honeysuckle and you might come across this. Uh, probably the best plant I know to get hummingbirds. Uh, you can see they also have an aphid problem all over the uh, flowers, and what this is going to do is actually is they're going to be pretty much, like, I would be amazed if I don't see ladybugs all over the thing. And just to go over more food sources that are becoming available to uh, ants as the year goes on, uh, it's not just aphids, we're also moving into caterpillar uh, time of year. Uh, actually, in this case, we're looking at a sawfly larva, but they pretty much are the same thing. They look exactly the same, caterpillar, sawfly larva. You know, same thing, just host plants are a little different. Uh, sawfly larvae, typically, they have the odd habit of hanging the, uh, the rear part of the, the, uh, caterpillar. They'll just hang, like, the back part up in the air. I don't see any of these doing it, though. Which was, you know, kind of neat, but I guess not all of them do it. But anyway, a sawfly, it's, um, it's in Hemenoptera, which is, uh, the subfamily, f or no, it's actually the, fe the, uh, order for, um, uh, bees, wasps, and ants. So they're kind of related to ants. And, uh, we actually have authentic caterpillars here, which is Lepidoptera. Uh, here we have, I don't, I actually don't even know what this is. There's a, there's a book of like more than 4,000 species of, <laughs> or more than 400 species of, uh, caterpillars that I could potentially have here. And, uh, a couple of ones. This one I know is a skipper, but the other one I'm not sure about that. 
And uh, now we're looking at a trillium. I figured it's, you know, sort of the end of wildflower week here in the US, so I figured why not look at, you know, some interesting wildflowers. I know I had an episode on that earlier in the month, but like, you know, come on, these are pretty. Anyway. And also, the benefit of uh, trilliums is their uh, seeds are actually distributed by ants, so later in the year I'm going to hopefully have a nice episode of Mirmiko Cor yeah, Mirmiko Cori. Seed distribution by ants. And we're looking at Trillium grandiflorum right now, which, uh, they begin opening white, and, uh, they eventually just turn pink. It's like a two-week process that they slowly turn pink. They stay white for, like, the first week, and then they turn this pinkish-purple-slash-magenta-y color. And you can see inside the, uh, flower here, some ants will actually steal nectar, but... Um, along with just, you know, looking nice in the garden, these add, like, extra surface area for foraging, uh ants to look over and just wander about. Now these yellow ones here are Trillium luteum, which actually have a, uh, a kind of a pleasant fragrance to them once you get your nose up to them. It's, 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 um, it's, it leans more toward being citrusy. And I have a couple other Trilliums that I don't even, like they haven't even flowered so I couldn't even tell you what they are. But um, coming around here we have yet another Trillium luteum. And then these other ones back here which were kind of a wonderful treasure find uh, is Trillium simile. And you can see there's ants just, you know, kind of crawling all over that. Well, not really all over that, but you get the idea. So, they're not really stealing a whole lot of nectar here, there's, but, you know, it's, it is being treated like a food source almost. It's almost like the ants are, uh, you know, patiently waiting for seeds to form, in my mind, you know. It's <laughs> kind of a neat thing here. You see Tapanoma sesli. Uh, a lot of hollow stem plants in this area. Like, that's just basically what's forming the uh, floor underneath all these plants, so... I get lots of opportunistic species around here, such as Tapanoma. Uh, Nylandria is also around, and uh, Temnothrax, also. So, we get lots of uh, opportunistic nesting uh, species. Also, Brunch and Mirami Mix. Brunch and No Mirami Mix? One of those, the smaller one. The smaller Nylandria, basically. And up here we have a uh, Temnothrax, if the camera would like to focus. Do do do. Do do do. There we go. <laughs> Trouble with using a point and shoot is you can't really control that. But um, we're looking at some lilies right now. They're, they're sort of. Uh, similar to trilliums. I think they're the same or similar family of plants anyway, but they don't bloom until later in the summer and they're not distributed by ants. Uh, just looking at another trillium. Trillium ver verdescens or some something like that. Which is a neat one. It actually produces its own odor, but the trouble is it's it leans more toward being rotten apples than uh, citrus, so it's not that pleasant of a smell. And you can see it gets loads and loads of flies. which are pretty much ideal for pollinating this, and uh, this trillium shouldn't be confused with uh, Trillium cuneatum, which uh, actually has the full red um, uh, flower petals on it, and does not produce any sort of an odor. Now here we have Nylanduria uh, flabopis. Flabopis? Yeah, I guess... I guess Flavis was taken or something like that for that name. It's kind of an odd... Maybe it means maybe it's Latin for like not quite orange or not quite brown or something like that, but you can see they kind of just move around on these flowers, and I'm focusing on these only because it's you know wildflower week or whatever. There, you know, we're getting to the end of that, but you know. Kind of neat, you know. So you can have like a you know an ant garden, but it can also look nice. Um, though these plants do take the better half of a decade to get to a flowering age. And you can see they're on the uh, Trillium luteum, too. This Trillium, normally they have three leaves. When I say leaves, I'm talking about the matted or... The, uh, the, you know, this thing here with multiple colors to it. Um, or multiple greens on it, but this one got damaged or something, so it only has two. Kind of odd. And there was another... Uh, this, you know, as I said, you know, it's, it's everything's warming up, so the um, colonies are starting to expand, and they're actually moving a nest here. Uh, this ant is so small and, like... It, it's easy to overlook. You just don't really... You know, so they're... Like, even here with this line, you you know, we're only looking at one ant, but that was... You know, that's what the four, that's what the whole trail was uh, for moving the nest. And... 
I don't actually I never actually found where they were going to, though I had a pretty good idea. At the end of this log, I have a uh, potted plant that I never got around to putting into the into the ground. And uh, the, you know, just the other day I decided, well, why don't I plop that sucker in the ground? You know, I've got a spot in the garden, so why not? And sure enough, I, you know, get it over to the uh, garden area after pre yeah, preparing the site. And I, you know, I, I dig the hole, I grab the pot, grab the plant, pull it out of the pot, and I find an entire colony of Nylanduria Flamophists right in there. <laughs> and uh, then I put it back in the pot, grab the camera, <laughs> came back out and staged this whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can see, you know, this ant, yeah. Fun thing about this ant is it's actually imported. You know, gasp. I know. <laughs> I wonder how it got into the country. Maybe, you know, it constantly importing non-native plants, such as peonies and, you know, other such uh, things. You know, probably food and uh, building materials, too, could probably host such a thing. Or, uh, you know, activity. But, you know, typically, you know, it's just a symptom of human commerce. As far as I know, this species in particular isn't that much of a pest, so they do enjoy eating my uh, raspberries a bit more than um, most. I guess, you know, that's not really fair. Polypius imperus, which is uh, somewhat you know, very related to this uh, genus entirely. Uh, I think they're in the same tribe anyway. You know, I find those on my raspberries too, but, you know, certainly not in as great a numbers. Uh, this is not the uh, Nylandria, or slash, you know, formerly known as Paratrichina. Uh, that is, I th I believe there's a major pest one. It's not the same species. It's, uh, there's a pest one that's that has not been identified yet, but it's uh, down south. I believe it's in uh, Florida and Georgia and thereabouts. Uh, probably, possibly Gulf Coast area. I'm not really up with the issue, but anyway, you can see how you know this colony you know moved from one part of my yard to the next, just from the fact that I was transplanting a plant from a pot doesn't take too much imagination to see how that works from country to country. So that does it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I have a blog, uh, Antsby's Butterflies Nature, that blogspot.com. And once again, my name is Chris Murrow, and uh, thank you for watching. Go read my blog. And now we're watching an ant on a dandelion. No, don't do it. You have the rest of your life out of you. Oh, no, yeah, I guess he wasn't. Hooray!